Hello, and welcome everyone to the Zuda Family Leaders in Parkinson's Disease Speaker Series. My name is Chris Watts, and I hold the position of Dean of the Harris College of Nursing and Health Sciences, in addition to Professor of Communication Sciences and Disorders here at TCU. And it is my privilege to host this event, and like you, I'm really looking forward to hearing from one of the world's leading experts about holistic care for Parkinson's disease. The agenda today will start with some introductory remarks from me, followed by Dr. Bloom's lecture. And there will be time for questions to Dr. Bloom from the audience. To ask a question, simply click on the Q&A button, which should be at the bottom of your Zoom, sc Zoom screen. Don't use the chat function, please use the Q&A. And you can do this at any time during the lecture, just type in your question. We will be curating these and we'll present as many as we can to Dr. Bloom when he's done. It is now my honor to introduce our keynote speaker, Professor Bastian Bloom. Dr. Bloom is a professor and consultant neurologist at Radboud University in Nijmegen, the Netherlands. He also serves as the medical director for Radboud UMC Center of Expertise for Parkinson and Movement Disorders, and is also the co-director of ParkinsonNet. He received his medical degree with honors at Leiden University Medical Center in 1993. And in 1994, he obtained his PhD at Leiden based on work investigating postural reflexes in Parkinson's disease. Professor Bloom received training as a movement disorder specialist during fellowships at the Parkinson's Institute in California, and the Institute of Neurology in London. In 2002, he founded and became medical director of the Radbud Center for Parkinson and Movement Disorders, which is recognized as a center of excellence for Parkinson's disease by the Parkinson's Foundation. Professor Bloom has published over 600 papers, including over 400 peer-reviewed international publications. He is regularly asked to speak at major national and international conferences, and also it talks just like this. He is co-author of the important book, Ending Parkinson's Disease, A Prescri Prescription for Action, with co-authors Michael Oaken and Ray Dorsey. And as I previously mentioned, he is the co-developer of ParkinsonNet, which has received multiple awards and serves as a global model for how we can improve the conception and delivery of healthcare to populations in need. So it's obvious that Professor Bloom is one of the world's leading authorities in movement disorders and Parkinson's disease, and I'm excited to turn this lecture over to him. Dr. Bloom, welcome. Thank you so much, Chris, for this heartwarming introduction. Um, it was actually impressive and spectacular to hear um, about all these developments happening there in the uh, in Texas. Um, I have to say, before I say anything else, uh, that I'm ever so thankful for being let off the hook, if you will. Uh, I was supposed to be physically in Texas right now, and everything was planned until literally, I think it was last Friday when I received an email that there is a crucial meeting on uh, uh, on Parkinson's in the Netherlands, uh, 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 on topics that I'll be talking about in a minute, about how to prevent the growth of Parkinson's. And I'm at the heart of this new project, and I simply cannot not be there. So I talked to Chris, and he graciously allowed me to do this lecture remotely. It's a solemn promise that I will come back for a an in-person uh, meeting. I had to make a selection of what I wanted to tell you. It's a lot more to tell you. So... I have all the witnesses at the other end of the line. I promise to come back to you um, in person. Um, having said that, it's always appropriate to start with uh, disclosures. Um, and my main disclosure is that I am said to have a mutation in the gene for optimism. Um, I'm literally a born optimist. And I'm a strong believer that we can, should, and will improve the quality of life for people with Parkinson's disease and Parkinsonism. I can imagine that there are folks at the other end of the line today who may have MSA or PSP or another form of Parkinsonism. The other disclosure that I have is that I am an activist. Um, so in addition to what Chris said about my track record, 
um, as a scientist, as a clinician, as a healthcare innovator, which is all true. Um, I'm also an activist. Uh, I'm, I'm in a fight against the rapid worldwide growth of Parkinson's because I strongly believe that Parkinson's is an environmentally driven condition and which makes it a preventable condition. And I'll talk to you about that in a minute in more detail. And yes, it's literally me there in the audience in case you were um, hesitating whether I was present or not. Um, Chris mentioned the book uh, Ending Parkinson's Disease, which has now been translated into Chinese, into German, uh, into Dutch, and uh, probably other languages will follow. It's been really well received. Um, I do not make any money out of the book. All proceeds go to the greater good, which is trying to end Parkinson's disease. So if you purchase the book, I really think you do yourself a favor by learning more about Parkinson's disease, but you also uh, support um, the cause of the fight against Parkinson's. And there is something happening. Parkinson's is the world's fastest growing neurological condition. It grows faster than Alzheimer's disease, it grows faster than stroke, epilepsy, any other neurological disease. It has doubled in the last 20 years, and it is projected to double again in the next 20 years, unless we take rigorous action. People often say, well, this is just aging, but that's actually not true. James Parkinson described the disease in 1817, um, when admittedly people grew less old than they do today. But mind you, one in three people with Parkinson's developed the disease under the age of 65. And in the late 1800s, early 1900s, if you survived childhood, the odds were that you grew to live, live to grow, you know, like, like 65. Um, and Parkinson's disease was described by James Parkinson based upon observations of people that he saw walking on the streets. That's how recognizable Parkinson's disease is. So if the disease had existed prior to 1817, it should have been described. But James Parkinson literally said, I'm witnessing a new, hitherto not described neurological condition. People have gone back to museums, um, poems, uh, novels, to look for traces of what could have been Parkinson's in the past. And if you look very carefully, if you lift up every tile, you know, you can find traces of what could possibly have been Parkinson's. But it was a very, very rare disease until we started polluting our environment. Mind you that James Parkinson described the disease in London at the time when the Industrial Revolution was taking place and where air pollution was taking grotesque forms um, that we're not even seeing today anymore. And Parkinson's disease happens in young people. Uh, you all know this, this fellow, uh, Michael J. Fox, who developed the disease in his early 30s. Um, this is a patient in my clinic who developed the disease at age 30, and she is pregnant with Parkinson's disease. Now, if in the 14th, 15th century, when the clinicians were astute observers, a woman in her 30s would have developed an asymmetrical resting tremor, a stooped posture, a shuffling gait. There was obviously no levodopa or any other treatment. It should have caught people's eyes and it was not described. And this is a very pro provocative graph that we just published in the Journal of Parkinson's Disease. Yes, the risk of Parkinson's disease increases with aging. You see in red the risk for men, which is higher than for women, and I'll come to that in a minute. Um, and yes, the risk increases with aging, but this is the risk for lung cancer. And the graphs are identical. They are identical. And no one in the world will tell you that aging is the cause of lung cancer. In this case, in the case of lung cancer, aging means you've had a sufficient number of years to smoke enough cigarettes to develop lung cancer, pack years. And in the on the same token, aging and the relation to Parkinson's means that the older you get, the more time you've had to be exposed to toxic chemicals in our environment. 
is it perhaps better diagnostics? Have we become better physicians? And are we now picking up Parkinson's that was missed in the past? This is again, very unlikely. In blue, you see the incidence, uh, or actually these are deaths of multiple sclerosis. Uh, and in red, you see Parkinson's disease. MS, multiple sclerosis, is now diagnosed with very advanced new techniques that we didn't have in the past. MRI, cerebral spinal fluid tests. Whereas Parkinson's disease is diagnosed today in the exact same way that James Parkinson diagnosed Parkinson's disease with our bare hands by listening to the story, by doing a proper neurological examination. Yet MS with all the better tests is not increasing and Parkinson's is exploding. So it's not better diagnostics. Is it perhaps genetics? Yes, genes do play a role in causing Parkinson's. We know that there are at least eight genes that have been linked to a higher risk of developing Parkinson's disease. And there are a number of ways of looking at the relative contribution of genetics to what is the overall picture of Parkinson's. And one very interesting approach is so-called twin studies. As you may know, you've got two types of twins, monozygotic twins, as shown in this photograph, which I think is beautiful, they are identical genetically, and dizygotic twins who are genetically not identical. But both types of twins grow up in the same environment. They breathe the same air, they eat the same food, at least until they are 20 years old. Interestingly, if the genetic component to any given condition is high, monozygotic twins, the couple here shown in the photo, should have Parkinson's together much more often than dizygotic twins who are genetically not identical. And people have looked at this question for a range of different medical conditions. And this is all those conditions arranged by the strength of the effect. So you can see at the top of the list is diabetes which is a very genetically determined condition. And you can see that out of all those twin studies, Parkinson's disease is at the bottom of the list. So yes, there is a genetic contribution, but it is relatively small. And more importantly, those genes contain mutations. And a mutation happens somewhere by a stroke of bad luck somewhere in the world. And then of course, these mutations start to travel as you pass it on to your children who may move on to the next village, marry another boyfriend or a girlfriend and gradually it spreads across the globe. By the extent of the spread across, across the planet, we can estimate the age of these genetic mutations. And guess what? For the most common mutations in the United States and elsewhere in the world, the GBA mutation and the LARC2 mutation, these are thousands of years old, thousands of years. And they tend to cause young onset Parkinson's disease. If those genes by themselves had been the cause of Parkinson's, we should have seen it. It should have been described by these neurologists in the past hundreds of years ago, if not thousands of years ago. But these genes, these mutations only became relevant after we started polluting our environment. And indeed, and this is really fascinating, if you introduce these gene mutations into an animal and you expose the animal to a pesticide or another toxin, they become extra sick. So yes, these genes are relevant, but they are relevant in that they make the individual extra susceptible to the toxic effects of environmental polluters, such as pesticides. And what you can see in the right column is paraquat, which is still used in the United States until today, rotenone, uh, manganese, which is a heavy metal, uh, and MPTP, which is another 
toxin closely related uh, to pesticides. So there's gene environment interactions, which only became relevant after we started polluting our environment. So I'm personally, and I'm not alone in this opinion, of the opinion that Parkinson's, just like the pyramids in Egypt, is very much a man-made disease, which potentially makes it a preventable disease. And that is why I call myself an activist. And what are the factors in our environment? Well, one of them is air pollution. Um, I already said that James Parkinson described the disease in London at the time of the Industrial Revolution. And even until today, a number of studies have linked air pollution to a higher risk of Parkinson's disease. And nitric oxide has been mentioned, but mind you, pesticides used by farmers can travel for miles and miles and miles through the air. So part of the air pollution could also be um, uh, pesticides, could be small plastic particles, could be all sorts of things. Repeated head trauma. Uh, we know that uh, American football players and in Europe, soccer players uh, with their headers um, against a football have a higher risk of developing uh, Parkinson's disease. I love this little cartoon drafted for the Dutch version of my book by one of my patients who's also an artist. This is Muhammad Ali punching his own brain uh, as a symbol for the uh, Parkinson's, which he may have developed as a result of repeated head trauma. Another major concern for you folks in the United States is trichloroethylene. Trichloroethylene has been banned in my country. It's still widely present, certainly on your environment in the United States. TCE, as it is also called, has been used widely in um, as a, a, to decrease metal in dry cleaning factories. Um, it was used in Tyvex. Remember the, the white fluid that you used to, when, when there were old type, uh, type machines, it was used in shoe polish. It was used to decaffeinate coffee. And quite interestingly, or disturbingly, I should say, industry used to dump trichloroethylene in the environment and it can stay there for years and years. It can travel underground, evaporate into your house, and you wouldn't know it. So this is a cartoon show it how it works. There's a factory contaminating the soil through groundwater. It can travel for miles. It can then evaporate into your house. You don't smell TCE. You cannot see TCE, but it can be the cause of your Parkinson's disease. And a recent paper work in the United States showed that in Camp Lejeune, which is one of your training camps for the military, there used to be a factory that dumped TCE in the environment. So it's a so-called uh, Superfund site with heavy pollution with TCE and service members at the Marine Corps uh, in um, Camp Lejeune had a significantly higher risk of developing Parkinson's disease compared to matched Marines who were trained at other camps where there was no such pollution. So something to be concerned about. And then of course, there were pesticides. Uh, this is a beautiful cartoon, again, from the Dutch version of my book, uh, linking pesticides uh, to Parkinson's disease. Uh, farmers have a significantly increased risk of Parkinson's and in various studies, the same was true for people living in the vicinity of farmland. Interestingly, it can explain why men, as I said to you earlier, are more often affected by Parkinson's because men are more often farmers than women. And what I find interesting is that one of the very, very few exceptions in the world is Japan, where women more often have Parkinson's than men. And in Japan, Women are more often farmers. Does this prove everything? No. Is it disconcerting? Is it converging evidence? I think yes. More importantly, if you expose animals, a mouse, a rat, a goldfish, a worm, a monkey, to pesticides, it knocks out 
the substantia nigra, the area of the brain involved in Parkinson's, and it leads to Parkinson's symptoms. So the combination of the epidemiological evidence plus the rodent work and the other animal work, again, provides converging evidence. But what I find really fascinating is the work done by um, various groups in the world on so-called heat maps. André Barbeau was a famous neurologist from Canada who unfortunately died at a young age. I believe he never made it beyond 55. And he was a genius. Much of his work uh, done in the 80s is still very true. And André Barbeau was one of the first to do so-called heat map studies. So what he did is he mapped the prevalence of Parkinson's disease in Quebec. And he reasoned that if the environment was irrelevant, Parkinson's would be spread out evenly like a porridge across the country. But instead, what he found was pockets, clusters, where there was much more Parkinson's compared to other clusters. And he could show that there was a one-to-one -one relationship with the concentration of pesticides in groundwater. So the higher the concentration of pesticides in groundwater, the higher the risk of Parkinson's across all of these clusters. That has been repeated in France. This is the risk of developing Parkinson's in France. And if you overlay this map with wine areas in France, there's a perfect match. Parkinson's in France is not evenly distributed. It follows the course of vineyards, where, of course, we know there is heavy pesticide use. In France, Parkinson's disease is now officially recognized as an environmental hazard disease among wine, yard, wine farmers. And just this morning, Germany has taken the same step. So both countries have recognized Parkinson's as a disease caused by pesticides due to their jobs. And this is your country, this is the United States, this is Louisiana, where again, Parkinson's is not evenly distributed it's patchy, there are clusters, and again, there was a tight relationship with the concentration of pesticides uh, in the environment. In the Netherlands, in my country, there appears to be a link with tulip fields. Our national pride, the tulip, uh, my nickname when I was trained in California at the Parkinson's Institute was Dr. Tulip. My family name is Bloom, so Bloom and Tulip. Um, and um, a number of studies have linked Parkinson's in my country to the tulip fields, including people living within 200 yards distance, their houses of the tulip fields. And in many ways, this is quite ironic because the tulip is the symbol of the international fight against Parkinson's disease. So isn't it ironic that the same flower that is symbolizing our joint mission is also associated with a higher risk of developing the same disease in my country. You can see on the left uh, the James Parkinson tulip that has been specifically grown for that purpose. And for all of you folks at the other end of the line, this is an important message because you might reason, oh, well, for me, it's too late. I already have Parkinson's disease. Here you go. There are now two studies and the third one is underway to show that if you already have Parkinson's disease and you are still being exposed to pesticides, your disease progresses faster. So if anything you, know, you do tomorrow or tonight is make sure that you avoid exposure to pesticides. And it makes perfect sense if you have Parkinson's you have few living cells left in the dopaminergic area in the substantia nigra. So you want to do everything to protect those remaining neurons. And you do that by protecting yourself from exposure to pesticides and presumably trichloroethylene, head trauma, and if at all possible, but I know that's difficult, uh, air pollution. And quite importantly, and what I'm very worried about is that we need to look at cocktails because the reality is that all of us are exposed not to single pesticides, but to complex mixtures of different pesticides. Farmers 
use multiple pesticides on their land. And by the way, please note that I am not blaming farmers in any way. Farmers are honest people doing an honest job according to regulations. The people that I blame is the regulators who do not adequately test for the risk of Parkinson's. They send farmers onto their jobs with compounds that have not been adequately tested. They've not been adequately tested in isolation and nobody looks at cocktails, which is a reality in daily life. The Dutch Sprint study, um, which has tested pesticides in nine European countries and in Argentina, has shown that in the farmhouses, in Dutch farms and in nine other countries in Europe, there are, guess what, 100 different pesticides in household dust. 100! What on earth is the sum of 100 little bits of pesticides? We don't know. I'm not claiming that this is the cause of Parkinson's. What I do know is that we are not certain that this is safe. And environmental agencies like the EPA in your country, like the EFSA in my part of the world, do not adequately take into account the reality that all of us are exposed to these different cocktails. Food products, for example, red wines in Dutch supermarkets contain seven different pesticides, including Roundup. Each time a Dutch citizen drinks a glass of red wine from France, you drink a minute bit of Roundup, you know, the, the, the weed killer, plus six other pesticides. We don't know what it does. It could be safe, which is what EFSA claims. It could be toxic, and we just don't know. What we do know is that this recent paper that came out in Nature Communications, which is a high quality international journal, Kimberly Paul and Beata Ritz from California, fed cocktails of pesticides to dopaminergic neurons on a glass dish. And they showed that a single pesticide was only toxic at high concentrations, the moment you added a second pesticide to the mix, they were both toxic at very low concentrations, including pesticides that were previously deemed to be safe in isolation. But as a cocktail, they were highly toxic. So this is worrisome. Now, I, I felt that I had to share this part with you because I'm really a man on a mission to create a healthier environment, which will help hopefully stop the growth of Parkinson's. And in doing so, we will probably also prevent cancer, cardiovascular disease, ALS, Alzheimer's disease, which have all been linked in some way to the environment. But now we'll move on to the actual topic of my presentation, which is holistic care. My other main disclosure is that I am a strong believer in a holistic approach to Parkinson's. And of course, you know this famous song by the monkeys. My other disclosure is that anything that helps my patients makes me happy. That is not to say that I will prescribe anything that's available on the planet to my patients. I will only prescribe what is evidence-based and where there is a high credibility, but I'll come to that in a minute. But if you are my patient, and if against my advice, you take something and you improve, then I'm happy. And then I want to learn and understand why you improved so that maybe I can translate that to other people. This is one of my favorite images. It is a famous cycling event in, the, uh, in, in Belgium, in Flanders. And the guy on the left is a Dutchman, our great national pride. Um, He's like the Davis Finney of the Netherlands. Um, and he beats the other guy who's from Belgium by less than an inch. And the difference between winning and losing among professional athletes is in details. You have to sleep well. 
your stress levels, your materials, your massage, your food, everything needs to be perfect. And if you have Parkinson's disease, everything needs to be perfect. Yes, your medication needs to be right. But in addition to the pills, you need to look at your sleep, your bowel movements, your exercise, your diet, your stress levels. And this is a cartoon from a paper that we published in The Lancet. It's a sort of symbolic universe where at the heart of the universe, the sun in the universe is you. It's the individual living with Parkinson's disease and the family. In yellow are the disciplines very frequently involved. It's a medical specialist like Professor Watts, myself, and it's your family doctor, your general practitioner. In green are disciplines that are often involved or to my mind, should often be involved, like a physiotherapist, speech language therapist, a psychiatrist, a dietitian, a social worker. But look at the large circle in blue. These are professional disciplines that can potentially add quality to your lives. Now, that's not to say that all of these individuals should be involved with every patient, and let alone at all times. It tells you, A, how complex Parkinson's is because you require so many disciplines. It also shows you how treatable Parkinson's is, provided that you understand your job. Think of a urologist. Think of a sex therapist. Think of an ophthalmologist for eye problems, a dentist, a pain specialist, a gastroenterologist, and the list goes on and on. But there's only one sun in the universe, and that's not the doctor, it's not the neurologist, it's you and nobody else. And thinking further about people living with Parkinson's, I'm very inspired by Steve Jobs, who made Apple great. And Steve Jobs made Apple great by listening carefully to his clients. And I think in healthcare, we should listen more often to what you think is important. So in my center, this is a picture of our multidisciplinary team. The guy with the laptop is somebody living with Parkinson's. And he is sitting in the inner circle to discuss medical issues as an equal member of the team. This photograph is very symbolic of how we look at multidisciplinary care in my center. And this is a book that just came out from Radboud University Press. Um, it's now available in English. And if you go to Radboud University Press, you can download the digital version of the book for free. And the book is all about photographs in black and white of a healthcare professional speaking to somebody living with Parkinson's, where each of the two individuals brought a, an object that was very meaningful to them. And they started a discussion around this. And the book is filled with these unique personal stories, passions and ambitions, larded with beautiful photographs. And the guy on the right is Bob Luntz, somebody who's been in my clinic for many, many years, and who I thought I knew very well, until he started a discussion around the museums that he helped to design and decorate, which is his passion and his job. And I can tell you, our relationship has never been the same. Uh, the lady on the left uh, has photography as a passion. And on the right, you see Omatola Thomas, um, who has a microphone as a symbol for her being a voice for women with Parkinson's, for the black community with Parkinson's, and also for people from Africa uh, with Parkinson's. And this is one of the most special people uh, in the book. It's Naut, uh, a beautiful man, a beautiful person with a little sound machine. And he told us during the interview, I am not my Parkinson's. I am so much more than just my Parkinson's. And I thought it was just beautiful. And we recorded a film um, to uh, based on the book. You know, in, in this article in The Lancet that I mentioned before, we said Parkinson's disease does not exist. What exists is 10 million different Parkinson's diseases. Everybody is different 
everybody is unique. And to symbolize that, we created this beautiful film um, with music that we specifically composed for this film. So you will see the photos from the book and listen to the lyrics of the song, which we tailor made uh, for this film. It's really compelling. Just listen. Isn't that beautiful? Um, and here you see 20 individuals, men and women, tall and small, uh, white people, black people, uh, men, women, you know, they're all different. They're all unique. And my passion is to deliver, you know, personalized care. And just a few examples about personalized care. This man has difficulty walking <coughs> when he has his wife on his right side. He can walk a lot better. Did you see that? It's quite remarkable. Yeah. Now, to make the story even, and I and and I like to show these examples because my greatest sources of inspiration, my mentors, are people living with Parkinson's, and I'm always inspired by their solutions. So he can walk better only when his wife is by his right side. So here he is, without his wife barely able to walk but when he holds his wife mentally he can walk just look at this when he puts his arm around her now he can walk isn't that amazing just the sheer thought that he can hold on to her is enough to make him walk and the story gets even better because he discovered that particular music helps him to move and it's music with 110 beats per minute, but it has to be 110 beats per minute, otherwise it doesn't work. And the fun fact is, he doesn't even like this music, but it helps him to move. Isn't that fascinating? But this other gentleman, has got equally severe Parkinson's, also great difficulty moving, even with a wheeled relator, he's barely able to move. But when he listens to the opera Orpheus and Eurydice by the composer Gluck, he starts to waltz with his wheeled relator. And I can tell you, I can look at this a zillion times and still be touched and moved. Isn't that incredible? And to my mind, this is really personalized precision medicine. Um, just listening to each unique individual and tailoring your treatment and your approach and your support to whatever is important to them rather than a one size fits all approach. And this is something new that I sort of discovered is about Parkinson's is what, what people tell me in my clinic is, my world is shrinking and my world is shrinking because my mobility diminishes. My world is shrinking because my voice becomes weaker. So I'm not able to participate in discussions as well as I used to. My cognitive abilities decline. And as a result of all of it, your world is shrinking and shrinking. And I saw a study published by an Australian group where they used people's smartphone, which contained GPS, and they plotted 
the range of mobility for people with Parkinson's onto the map of Sydney and early stage Parkinson's just after the diagnosis. People had a huge range there. They were crossing from left to right across the map. And as the disease progressed, the circles became smaller and smaller and smaller until in the final, final, final days of Parkinson's, it was reduced to a dot on the map, which was the bed in the nursing home. And I think my great passion in, in Parkinson's is to make your world bigger again by improving mobility, by improving communication, by improving social interactions. Another crucial part of the team, and, and I'm sure that there will be carers also listening to my talk today, uh, is the importance of carers. And we did this beautiful study, which we published, where we asked former carers whether they were able and willing to share their knowledge with the present carers. And we were driven, our motivation was that carers often have rich experience in helping and supporting their loved ones. If at one point the person with Parkinson's dies, the carer is left behind alone, often falls into a black hole because you've lost a lot of meaning and sense in your life. And all that knowledge and expertise is gone. So we reached out to former carers, whether they were able and willing to support present carers. And not all of them did, but many of them were actually enthusiastic and shared their knowledge. And we published a book, it's available in Dutch, but perhaps this could be of interest for you to translate or to redo the experiment, you know, in, 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 in Texas. Because now we have this book full of useful information provided by former carers to support pre present carers. It, and it's really, it was a beautiful project. Another wonderful example of personalized precision medicine was this box that was drafted by the same patient who did the illustrations for my Dutch book, Marina Noordegraaf, who said, we people with Parkinson's, we don't just need dopamine. What we need in particular is hopamine. Isn't it insanely beautiful? And she drafted this pillbox filled with hopamine. And I remember to this day that I said, oh, Marina, I, I totally get it. And I told her what I felt was hopamine. And I will show you a quick video of our National Parkinson Net Congress, where we had 3,000 healthcare professionals. And there was a patient with Parkinson's who'd given the keynote plenary lecture. And spontaneously, the 3,000 professionals started to sing, you'll never walk alone. J just look at the video. It's goose goosebumps all over the place. <laughs> Just imagine that everybody is singing that you'll never walk alone. And then Marina said, Baus, this is your hope I mean. My hope I mean is that there will be a cure one day. And she told me that hope I mean is literally personalized. It's hope of mine. Isn't that beautiful? And I now address the issue of hopamine routinely in my clinic when I speak to people with Parkinson's and their families um, as an important element um, uh, in the overall management approach. Uh, and we published about this uh, with Marina as the first author. Um, uh, and I'm happy to share all those. This is an open access paper that anybody can read for free. Um, and then another concept that I just wanted to share quickly is one of my other patients said, 
Klaus, is there such a thing as an upside to having Parkinson's? And as you know, this is called a silver lining. So Parkinson's is the pitch dark cloud. You never wished that you had Parkinson's. But this, this one patient said, is there a possibility that there is also something positive to having Parkinson's? And my initial reaction was, no, of course there isn't. You know, it's a horrible disease and there's nothing positive. And then later I realized that I was not the one to answer this, that I should ask my patients. So I posted a video on social media, on Instagram, on Facebook, on YouTube. And in the most careful possible way, I reached out to all of you folks and said, you've never asked for Parkinson's. You would wish you were cured tomorrow, but realizing Parkinson's is here and it's here to stay for some time, have you found anything positive? And lo and behold, one third said, no, we, we can't find anything positive. One or two people were even insulted. But when I told them carefully again why I asked this question on behalf of a fellow patient, they understood and they were happy. And two thirds had indeed found positive effects. They said, I've started to exercise more. I quit smoking. I eat healthier. I've become an ambassador for Parkinson's. I work less and I travel more. I spent more time with my family. So they used the diagnosis to lead a better life. And again, I'm not saying you should be thankful for having Parkinson's, but it's important to think about this possible silver lining, which is only a thin line, you know, attached to a thick, dark cloud. Uh, but I, again, discuss this routinely in my clinic and all the ins and outs can be found uh, in this paper. And Jos Fute, Omotola, Thomas, Larry Gifford and John Stanford are all patients with Parkinson's who are authors um, uh, on this uh, publication. And this is a painting in the article by one of my other patients who is a pediatrician um, who lives uh, uh, in Malawi uh, in Africa. Now, finally, a quick word on alternative medicine, which I think is really interesting because I promised you that I would be speaking about holistic medicine. And the word holistic, when I spoke to Professor Watts about a title for my talk, I purposely used the word holistic. Now, among many of our colleagues, holistic is often inadvertently equated with alternative medicine. Alternative medicine uh, has a bad connotation as being unproven, not evidence-based, sometimes costly, uh, but definitely uh, not efficacious. Now, what is interesting, this is a busy cartoon, but I, I'll, I'll, I'll make it simpler for you. What we did is in the Netherlands, we asked Dutch patients about the use of plant-based natural products. And this is something easier for you to read. One in four patients used plant-based natural products, curcumin, cannabis. Now, this is the Netherlands, I realize, but cannabis was 7%. And also mucuna pruriens, I'll come to that in a minute. But only 40% of those had discussed it with their physician, which I think is not good. For example, mucuna contains levodopa, and I want to know whether my patients use mucuna or not. I want to know whether people use cannabis. Cannabis um, uh, can cause hallucinations or cognitive decline. Uh, so I want to know. Um, so I'm showing this slide because we know that all sorts of alternative or complementary medicine are widely used by people with Parkinson's. And sometimes there's a gold nugget. Digitalis was part of a mixture of plants used by a witch in England in the 18th century. And William Withering, out of the mix of plants, distilled Digitalis which until today is one of our most efficacious cardiac medicines for arrhythmias. So alternative approaches can actually contain efficacious medications. And I will argue in the final part of my presentation that I feel that there is just 
one type of medicine. Of course, there are differences in the level of credibility. There are interventions that are highly credible and there are interventions that lack sufficient credibility. And credibility is based on at least two components. One is the rationale for the treatment. Does it make any logical sense to try this? And second is the evidence from clinical trials. And let me walk you through my line of reasoning. Levodopa, the cornerstone, the mainstay of treatment for all of you, has a good rationale because the brains of people with Parkinson's are characterized by a loss of dopamine producing cells in the substantia nigra. At the top, you see a healthy brain, the bottom, Parkinson brain, loss of the pigmented cells in the substantia nigra, and you can see a Lewy body on the right. So levodopa has a good rationale. There's also good evidence for levodopa, and I'll come to that in a minute. Now, I've drafted this theoretical cartoon, and, and I'll walk you through it. So the chances of a treatment being accepted by the scientific community, the odds that people like Professor Watts or me will start prescribing a treatment depends on the credibility, which ranges from extremely low to very high. And the higher the credibility, the more likely you will receive that treatment as being prescribed by your physician or by your physical therapist or dietitian, for that matter. At the far end is retroactive prayer. A retroactive prayer was actually published in the British Medical Journal, which is a highly esteemed journal. This paper was done by a priest who said, time is not linear. If I pray today for people who were admitted to the intensive care 20 years ago, I can make sure that people leave the intensive care sooner thanks to my prayer, retroactive prayer. Now, depending on your own ideas about science, this is a completely non-logical intervention. Although he went on to show that people actually left the intensive care sooner compared to people for whom he did not pray. But the paper was actually sort of tongue in cheek to show how easy it is to make spurious observations and that you really need a good uh, rationale. So I think retroactive prayer is on the far left. I think the rationale does not make much sense. And at the slightly to the right is swimming with dolphins. Swimming with dolphins has a slightly better rationale because it may relieve anxiety. Swimming is a physical exercise. Um, it's a social event, um, but no trials. So that's why it's on the left, but it's slightly better than retroactive prayer. Levodopa is at the far right. It has a good rationale, the lack of dopamine uh, in the brain, and there is a good trial, a placebo controlled, dose controlled, trial published in the highest possible medical journal, the New England Journal of Medicine, to show that levodopa is better than placebo, and the higher the dose, the greater the effect. Case closed. We trust levodopa. Interestingly, deep brain stimulation, the surgical treatment for Parkinson's, is slightly more to the left, because it is very difficult to do a proper placebo-controlled trial uh, for DBS. Uh, but DBS is, of course, well-established, has a good rationale, many scientific studies, so a credible intervention. What I will propose to you here is that the debate in the medical field and the debate in the clinical examination room should not be about interventions on the left. I don't think we should spend money on interventions to the left. I think it is obvious that the limited funding we have goes to interventions on the right. The question is, what do we do with the 50 shades of gray in between? The gray area in between is what fascinates me. 
This is where cannabis is, mucuna pruriens, vitamins, dietary interventions. Um, and of course, you, you may have seen or may not, I've actually never seen the film, but I like the title, Fifty Shades of Grey. It goes from pitch dark to don't do this, to light grey, which is close to being becoming an evidence-based treatment. And Ray will tell me when I need to quit. I, I think if I understood correctly, I have an hour and he spent 10 minutes with the introduction. So I've got about nine minutes left. I'll quickly give you a few examples. Pitch dark is the abuse. And I literally call this abuse. The abuse that some companies take of your despair. When you hear those three terrible words, you have Parkinson, what you feel is despair. Your future collapses. Your hopes and your dreams may be gone or need to be replaced by completely new dreams. But people are definitely desperately desperate, particularly in those early days. And there are companies that sell you for a lot of money, stem cells. This is criminal. Companies such as this, and you can find it on Google, that try to sell you stem cells. And I've had patients in my clinic who sold their house to buy these stem cells, which is completely not evidence-based. It's a crime. And this is abuse. This is not dark gray. This is pitch, pitch black. Slightly more gray, you can see that the colors are changing, is the area of side effects. Because alternative medicine, complementary medicine, can also have side effects. An example is manganese. Manganese is tried by some patients as a treatment for their disease. This is a young woman. This is not Parkinson's, but this is a young woman who used manganese to treat acne, the skin disease in puberty. And it caused irreversible damage to her basal ganglia. And she will be like this for the rest of her life. And this is the MRI scan of her brain with manganese accumulating in the basal ganglia. Vitamin B6, this is work published in the United States in the New England Journal of Medicine. If you take an overdose of vitamin B6, it kills off neurons and can leave you devastated. So don't think alternative medicine, if it doesn't benefit me, it will certainly not harm me. That's not true. They can have severe side effects. And by sticking to non-evidence-based treatments at the far left end of the credibility spectrum, it may lead to delays in treatments that are effective and thereby deprive you from improvements in quality of life. All right, slightly less dark gray is, for example, curcumin. Curcumin has a bit of a rationale, but no good studies to support it. Um, even more slightly gray, we're moving to better and better evidence, is mucuna pruriens. And I'm actually curious, and perhaps this is interesting for the discussion, to hear how many folks of you are using mucuna. Mucuna is a Ayurvedic bean that contains levodopa, which is the exact same levodopa that you take in your Cinemet or Metapar or other pills for Parkinson's. But it's a natural product. So some people have a romantic idea that because this is a natural product, it may work better, but it's the exact same deal. The problem is we don't know exactly how much levodopa is in these jars in contrast to the pills prescribed by pharma. And it does not contain carbidopa or benzeracide, the help compound that makes sure that the levodopa is not converted to dopamine in your blood, but actually reaches your brain. We published a case about a woman with Parkinson's who was on mucuna monotherapy, was severely debilitated, and I just gave her a little bit of carbidopa, which prevents the peripheral conversion in blood into dopamine, 
and she was dramatically improved. I'll just show you a quick video. This is her on Mucuna, the plant-based product, monotherapy. You can see the asymmetry of the disease. And this is with Carbidopa, much better, much better. I won't play the whole video in the interest of time. And also in the light gray area is dietary interventions, nutrition. And I'm fascinated by the possible merits of dietary interventions. Um, for example, to treat constipation. Constipation is an early and prominent sign in many people with Parkinson's. And drinking a lot of water, perhaps using probiotics. There's one study of probiotics showing possible effects. So this is still in the gray area, but this is definitely an area where I think we could spend money on proper studies to look at probiotics. I tell all my patients, drink half a gallon of water per day. You cannot improve your bowel movements without drinking enough water. And if your bowel movements are not up to par, the likelihood is that you'll have bacterial overgrowth and these bacteria neutralize your levodopa in the gut. So unpredictable response to levodopa, poor response to levodopa is often related to the gut. So we need to put much more emphasis on dietary interventions to improve the gut, high fiber diets, sufficient fluid intake, perhaps probiotics, definitely high fiber diets. And if you don't know what a high fiber diet is, find a dietitian. And then finally, in the, I'm actually going to make it in the final two minutes. What we've also seen is that certain interventions dropped out. Um, they, 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 they fell from grace, if you will. We always felt for a long time that wine was good for people's health. And I hope I'm not disappointing you folks out there, but this was overly romantic. We only published the studies that showed positive effects. We ignored the studies that were negative. But as it turns out, there is no good evidence to support the benefits of wine, whereas pathologists will tell you one glass is more toxic to your liver, to your brain, than no wine or no alcohol. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't drink alcohol. I certainly do, but be aware that alcohol is not proven to be effective in contrast to what we used to think. Vitamin E is another dropout. It's been tested um, in a number of studies um, as a possible disease modifier for Parkinson's as an antioxidant, and the studies failed. So that one also dropped out. And another one that dropped out, and I'm mentioning it because some of you may be spending a fortune on this, is coenzyme Q10, which has also been tested and never been proven to be effective. So I just want to quickly jump and skip a few slides and go to the final slide, which I want to share with you before we go and return to NAUT. Um, remember NAUT, the, um, the guy with his sound machine from the book. NAUT was the guy who said, I am so much more than my Parkinson's disease. And my final slide is what Naut taught me and what is a source of inspiration and a muse in my life. What Naut said is, I'm Naut. Thank you very much. Dr. Bloom, thank you very much. That was an amazing presentation. You certainly validated your, your standing as a global thought leader and I think have uh, inspired a lot of thoughts in all of the people that are that are here listening to this. We do have some questions that I would like to present to you that are from the audience. Um, and audience out there, you are still able to uh, ask questions if you would like using the Q&A function. So uh, Dr. Bloom, the first question to you is about uh, some holistic approaches. Um, is whole body vibration plate therapy or whole body vibration beneficial to individuals with Parkinson's disease. Has that ever come across your radar? Sure, it has. Uh, so this is Shirley. Uh, Shirley, that's a good question. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, Charcot, the famous neurologist in the 19th century, already was interested in vibration. 
And there were anecdotes of people on old trains with Parkinson's who improved because the train was bouncing up and down. Uh, the studies so far have been disappointing. There are huge placebo effects involved. Um, we worked with a company that saw spectacular effects uh, with vibration therapy. Uh, when we gave placebo vibration, the effect was equally large. So I think there's potentially something out there, but this is, to my mind, still in the dark gray area. Um, there's a bit of a rationale and not much evidence. So this is an example of a treatment that I would not prescribe yet. If you decide to do it yourself and if you improve, then I'm interested and then I'm happy for you. But this is an, an example of something that I think deserves better research uh, and that I will not describe at this point myself. Thank you for that answer. The next question is from Tricia, uh, who asks about the, the pesticides and chemicals that you mentioned in your lecture, such as TCE, Paraquat, Rotenol. Can those be tested for in the soil and waters? Is this what they're doing in the studies? Yes, this is definitely what they're doing in studies. I know TCE can be measured. Um, uh, the authorities are aware in your country of so-called Superfund sites, which are heavily contaminated uh, with TCE. So TCE can be measured. Um, uh, and I know from environmental studies that uh, 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 pesticides can also be measured, for example, in groundwater. Uh, well water has been linked in many studies, in particularly in the United States, to the higher risk of Parkinson's. I know, unlike in my country, uh, where everybody has tap water, and many people in the United States still derive their water from wells and pesticides and heavy metals make their way into the into the well water. Uh, and yes, you can measure this. How this could be arranged near your house, I don't know, but you'd have to ask your probably your local authorities. Uh, Professor Ray Dorsey in, in Rochester is a worldwide leading authority uh, in your country, uh, and he might be able to provide more information. Um, the paper on TCE is published in Journal of Parkinson's Disease, and that's an open access journal. It's called Open Access. And read that paper. It's very useful, uh, and you'll, you'll learn a lot about it. Thank you, Dr. Bloom. Uh, Tyra asks about the application of artificial intelligence to Parkinson's, specific to early detection of Parkinson's. Have you read anything in the research that's applying AI to Parkinson's disease? Yeah, absolutely. That is a an excellent question. AI obviously taking a, there's, there's massive developments. Uh, we've got a big AI group in my own center, uh, mainly to um, look at wearable sensors for tracking Parkinson's at home. Uh, but this is already when you have Parkinson's, <clears throat> we're using AI uh, for voice analysis and to see whether we can uh, quantify the severity of Parkinson's in the response to treatment from voice. Um, we use AI to look at video images um, because clinicians score, you know, like the tapping score visually, but it's subjective and, and highly uh, fluctuating, uh, whereas a machine can do this more objectively. Um, for early diagnosis, uh, yes, um, a number of interesting studies. People have looked at uh, wearable sensors, for example. Uh, many of us use smartphones and smart watches. And for example, arm swing can be detected. Uh, typing behavior on a smartphone can already reveal the earliest signs of Parkinson's. Um, we suspect that if you keep a smartwatch on your wrist, we might be able to detect sleep issues early on in the course of Parkinson's. None of that has been fully validated and is ready for use. If it becomes available, it will be for clinical trials mainly to recruit people early into trials where we test for new medications or other interventions that aim to slow down the progression of Parkinson's. So it will be a while until this is available for clinical purposes, but there are definitely uh, important developments in that arena, yes. Thank you, that's exciting. Uh, David asks about funding for research. He says, here in the US studies require money and getting studies funded to look at solutions maybe aren't done because there's no profit to motivate the study. How does that compare to the Netherlands? And if it's the same, how do studies get funded? Uh, how do you think they should be dealt with? Now, David, that is an excellent question. And it's frustrating. 
um, you're absolutely right. When there is a big pharma money involved, um, it's easier to fund a trial and, and, and how to do a trial of high fiber diet, how to do a trial of drinking more water for that matter. Um, the way we deal with it, I, I, I do find that, for example, in the nutrition area, um, uh, supermarkets, for example, are, are more interested. So you have to think out of the box and look at other private partners. Um, um, of course, uh, uh, donors, uh, such as the family that's supporting the work of Professor Watts uh, and his team uh, is extremely helpful. Um, uh, um, so private donors should be informed about the importance of this holistic approach and the difficulties we have in finding evidence for those components where pharma is not interested. Um, I work intensely with the Michael J. Fox Foundation who are doing amazing work in the United States. Although a minor critique is that they're still heavily biased again towards the pharma studies and relatively less so towards the, uh, for example, exercise or stress or dietary interventions. There are smaller foundations in the US, the Davis Finney Foundation, I mentioned him before, the famous cyclist, uh, the Brian Grant Foundation, the Kirk Gibson Foundation, all former athletes who've started small foundations with an interest in exercise. Ultimately, it's a matter of bundling forces, raising awareness. And ultimately, I think your voice is important. You know, in our book, Ending Parkinson's, we've drawn the comparison to AIDS where people with HIV, who was, which was a relatively rare condition, literally chained themselves to the front door of pharma companies and demanded better treatments. And I think the Parkinson community has been relatively silent. Um, I can tell you from the bottom of my heart that I love working with people with Parkinson's. They are the f among literally among the friendliest nicest people on the planet but sometimes i think you are too nice and too kind and too patient maybe we should raise our voice demand more government funding insist that funding bodies such as the fox foundation spend more money also on this more holistic approach uh, and ultimately also persuade private donors uh, to make more investments specifically in this area um, and, and, and yeah, and we have to continue that fight together. I, I hope I've answered your question. Yes, thank you. So just a couple of comments and a couple of more questions. Uh, Sandy's asking for a bibliography. I can maybe reach out to you sure. after the lecture for some of the references that you presented here. Uh, Michelle wants to borrow some of that hopamine. Um, sure. Like that. Here it is. <laughs> And then Claire's asking about uh, your experience with DBS. Uh, what results have you seen with deep brain stimulation? Is it something that you uh, recommend for your patients? Yeah, definitely. So DBS has been a major development in the Parkinson field. A couple of things about DBS. So deep brain stimulation is a surgical intervention for Parkinson's. And it's one of the available treatments to fight fluctuations in the response to oral pharmacotherapy. Um, a requirement is, is that you still respond to oral pharmacotherapy, but that your response becomes unpredictable and fluctuates. If you don't respond to oral treatment, then DBS is no option. What DBS does, it replicates more of the good moments at the expense of fewer of the bad moments. Bad moments will always persist, but the proportion of the day spent in good time will go up at the expense of less time in a bad condition. It's not a cure for Parkinson's. The disease continues to progress. We need to select the candidates well, do an on-off test and demonstrate that people are still responsive to the oral treatment. Um, there are other reasons why you can't do it, uh, like certain abnormalities in the brain on the scan or if your cognition is uh, maybe too weak, um, but definitely for a fairly large proportion of patients, this is a viable option. And just to mention the alternatives, so it's it's for fluctuators. The alternative is either a 
subcutaneous epimorphin treatment, which I don't think is available in the United States, but soon, maybe already today, it's, it's available now in my country, is subcutaneous levodopa provided by Apvi. And there is levodopa through a pump delivered through the stomach right into your intestinal system. So there are multiple ways of fighting the response fluctuations. And if it's done properly, you as a patient are adequately informed about the pros and cons of each of those four options. And then the ultimate decision is a shared decision based on the experience of the doctor and your preferences and your own unique medical situation. Thank you. Uh, just a few more questions because it's already tomorrow where you are compared to us. Um, Sandy asks about uh, N-acetylcysteine. Uh, has there been any testing on that and its association with Parkinson's disease that you're aware of? Yeah, that's an interesting question, Sandy. And I must honestly, so I always tell my students, if you're not sure, you have to tell people you're not sure. So you should never guess. And acetylcysteine is an antioxidant. I think it's been tested. We never prescribe it, which must mean that there is not enough evidence. Um, whether testing is ongoing, I don't know. So my honest answer is, Sandy, it's an interesting question because it's an antioxidant and we feel that oxidative stress plays a role in the pathophysiology of Parkinson's. To the best of my knowledge, this is at the moment not an evidence-based treatment. Whether anything is ongoing, I don't know. Okay, and I will get the name of the book from Radboud. Uh, it's, it's, it's Holding Still Together. Holding Still Together. Okay, great. Yeah. Oh, and and then I'm going to combine two two questions into the last one and, and really just ask you, uh, you, you talked about pesticides, you talked about air pollution and some other environmental toxins or causes. But what are some additional environmental links to Parkinson's that uh, you may want to mention to the audience? Well, I think I've mentioned the most important ones. I, 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 I note in, in the, the RIMA, is asking about oil-based or plug-in fragrances in, in the home. That's, to my mind, never been linked to Parkinson's. So what is what is number one on the list? Well, number one and two on the list is TCE, trichloroethylene. Uh, and make sure that you test, ask the authorities for Superfund sites. And even if it's like two, three miles down the road, it could still go into your house because it travels for long distances underground. So trichloroethylene is a key one. Pesticides is a key one. Uh, and again, pesticides travel through the air. Um, uh, they're also in the food chain. We don't know, by the way, whether food contaminated with pesticides is a cause of Parkinson's. I'm concerned about it, but we don't know. And epidemiologically, it's very difficult to prove. I can tell you that if I would develop Parkinson's tomorrow, I would try to steer away from pesticides as much as I can. I would eat biological, which I'm already doing, and I would live on the treadmill or do some other form of exercise. Uh, head trauma is something to be prevented, and there's air pollution. We've spoken to the WHO, the World Health Organization, about the relationship between air pollution and Parkinson's, and they said, well, we realize, but we can't do anything about it. End of story. So that was highly frustrating. Uh, if you live near a factory, there's not much you can do about air pollution other than making sure that you, I don't know, ventilate your house well, which is probably a good idea anyway. Dr. Bloom, thank you again so much. I do have some concluding remarks. Um, let me scroll through this real quick and um, just say thank you for joining us all the way from the Netherlands where it is tomorrow. Um, I want to send more words of appreciation to the Zuda family. I want to make sure everybody knows that we have another Leaders in Parkinson's Disease speaker coming in August. Dr. Indu Subramanian from UCLA will be joining us. Uh, please mark your calendars for Saturday, August the 31st. Uh, if you're on our mailing list, we'll be sending plenty of information to you about this, including social media. 
and uh, hey, consider giving to uh, the Endeavor here. Uh, Kendall Riddell is our Director of Development. Her email address is kendall.riddell at tcu.edu. If you need any information about what we're doing here at TCU, please feel free, free to contact her. And uh, once again, Dr. Bloom, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and wisdom and being up so late. Uh, it's time for you to go to bed. Thank no, it's it's it, it, it's it's perfectly fine. And you've heard my promise, Chris. Uh, um, again, I'm, I, I appreciate that I can attend my important meeting tomorrow, which will help to create a healthier environment. It's all about pesticides and Parkinson's tomorrow. Um, uh, but I, I will come back to Texas. We look forward to bringing you to Fort Worth and, and showing you where the West begins. I Have can't wait. Day. Thanks, right. everybody. Bye-bye.